good afternoon and uh, welcome. Uh, we are here uh, for our seminar and uh, we are here with uh, Hannah Bush. She is uh, a PhD student uh, and uh, she work uh, about uh, um, a, a project uh, digital forensics uh, for historical documents. She studied German Italian studies at the universities of Bonn and Florence, but uh, in, uh, in these years uh, she worked uh, uh, at the Center for Digital Humanities uh, about uh, uh, the digital humanities for the paleography, in uh, special for the Latin paleography. And we are very happy uh, uh, that she is uh, with us uh, and she uh, can divide with us uh, uh, her um, studies. Uh, I give uh, word her, Anna Prego. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction and for having me. I'm going to share my screen first. Um, yeah, I'm here today to talk to you about machines and manuscripts, uh, computation approaches to study medieval Latin paleography. Um, and I'm mostly presenting my ongoing PhD research where we try to develop uh, uh, image similarity search for medieval Latin paleography. To start with, as probably everyone who is working with manuscripts has noticed in the past 20 to 30 years, a lot of digitization um, has been going on of large scale digitization. So a lot of manuscripts and collections have been digitized and made available digitally. Um, the project Digitized Medieval Manuscripts lists about 600 institutions. It's probably by now more because the slide is not the most updated one, I think. Um, and about 150 collections share the image and metadata with IIIF. So with the standards of the International Image Inter Interoperability Framework. Um, as you can see in this heat map is that uh, not all over the world manuscripts are digitized. So um, you can see in Europe, there's a center in Switzerland, Germany, Austria, and also the Netherlands appear pretty much um, visible, but it's probably more because a lot of libraries have some manuscript digitized, um, but not as much as one would expect, but I come back to that later. So um, most libraries that are available via IIIF, which is a standard to makes it, that makes it possible to view manuscripts and compare manuscripts that are stored in different repositories in one viewer and also to compare the metadata um, are part of the big projects, Digital Scriptorium and Ecodices Switzerland. So now that we have all those images available, um, the question arises what we can do with those thousands of images. Of course, we can look at them, we can access the books um, virtually, but we can also use them to develop new research questions. We can maybe even answer the research questions that we are developing. And we can search images instead of the classical catalog and keyword and text-based searches. And we can try to build new tools to explore collections of medieval manuscripts. So my focus today will be on digital paleography, um, which is also known as computer aided assisted or computer assisted paleography. And now we witness um, a turn towards artificial paleography, which means we are automating processes more and more. Ariana Chula has um, defined digital paleography as the study of ancient handwriting supported and enhanced by digital technologies. Digital paleography um, includes all sorts of image processing, um, image retrieval, 
image annotation, conceptual models of handwriting, pattern recognition on a microstructure level, so analyzing strokes or pixels in images, machine learning, and deep neural network learning. My focus in this presentation will be mostly on the deep neural network learning because that's what that's the approach we are following in our project. So it's now about 20 years or almost 23 years that uh, there are projects that are concerned with digital palography, starting with the SPI system for palographic inspections in um, PISA. Um, that was the project that Ariana Chula was involved in. Um, the CEEC project in Cologne, um, a project in 2008 called Damals in Graz, where um, they do it up to day, up to now, uh, where they encode all features in scripts manually um, in, in uh, transcriptions. So they are hyper-transcribing texts. There are a lot of, uh, there are some projects like the Grapheme project that uh, tries different computational methods to analyze features in scripts. Um, and uh, there have been projects on um, writer identification, like the Puma project on papal charters on the high middle ages, or DigiPol, uh, which is now I think called Archetype by Peter Stokes and his colleagues, um, where you can manually annotate letter forms um, and then process that data further. And also, yeah, a lot of uh, projects are happening in, in Paris. Um, for example, the Oriflamme project and also Grafim was based in Paris um, that also organized the CLEM competitions uh, by Dominique Stutzmann and others, um, where they organized competitions on writer identification and script classification. So and then there is the project I'm currently working on, the Digital Forensics project. Um, and we are following a slightly different approach because we are not looking at single features, so-called single features. So we are not analyzing characteristics um, of letters. So we are not pointing out we want to analyze the M or a speci specific angularity in the letters, but um, we look at the script as a whole. Um, and we are using everything that is available by F. That's uh, why I pointed it out beforehand that uh, basically our corpus uh, consists of all manuscripts that are available on the internet via the IIIF standards. And then of course for HDR, so for handwritten text recognition and uh, optical character recognition, there are projects like Transcribus um, from Austria and Kraken also developed in Paris, um, which is an open source project. Most of the projects are more on the terms of qual qualitative um, analysis, not looking at a huge amount of manuscript data because uh, the approaches are very um, computing intense. So you need a lot of computational power um, to extract single features and segment them and then analyze them. Um, and that forms of analysis are tedious and labor intensive, um, also time intensive. Um, and also a lot of tools that are tested and, and developed uh, have a lack of visual interfaces, which I think is always important for the humanities scholar and the digital humanist uh, that is not code literate. Um, yeah, visual analysis and machine learning can uh, gain with, with visual analysis and machine learning, you can gain insights and extract knowledge. You can detect outliers and erroneous information you can find uncertainties and you can compare more data and more features than you can with um, manual analysis. So the project um, I'm working on is called Digital Forensics for Historical Documents, Cracking Code Cases with New Technology. And it's located in Amsterdam at the Royal Academy of uh, Arts and Sciences at the Houghton's Institute for History and Culture of the Netherlands and at the International Institute for Social History. So one part of the project is concerned with uh, 17th century data, I think, uh, and writer identification. And my part of the project is concerned with med medieval Latin palaeography. So why is it so interesting to um, use script to date and localize the origin of a medieval Latin manuscript? 
script. So as you can see, the script in the Middle Ages changed it rapidly um, from the 7th to the 15th century. So each script sample contains basically information uh, about the date uh, and place where it was produced. And we want to use deep machine learning, which is machine learning um, is about learning some properties of data set and applying them to new data to date and localize or help dating and localizing medieval manuscripts, which means um, we want to use the information we have about those script samples, for example, when they were written and when they were written um, to teach a computer to tell us or to search for uh, image samples that share similar features. So we have a finding aid in, um, for dating and localizing medieval manuscripts. The interesting about deep machine learning is that uh, it kind of imitates the human visual perception. So um, it looks at an image like we do. When we see, for example, a cat, we know that it's a cat no matter um, if it's lying, sitting, or running. Um, we also recognize faces of, of people, and sometimes we can't even tell why we recognize those faces or what we compare to distinguish between two different people. Um, deep machine learning for paleography is an associative and experimental approach. It encourages us for lateral thinking. Um, and one of the most important things, I guess, is that it's uh, that image retrieval can be a very powerful addition to existing metadata based search functions. So we know often that um, we are looking for manuscripts um, and we search for a specific year of production or for a specific place or scribe. And we don't get any search results back because that information is missing in the metadata. So um, we won't get any results. Also, artificial intelligence is subjective, which again aligns with uh, how a human does think um, and not objective like uh, a normal search function. So this is a slide that uh, presents in a nutshell uh, the setup of, of our uh, tool. So basically, as I mentioned before, we use the manuscript pool that is available via IIIF. Um, which is about 10,000 plus manuscripts. And then um, the idea is that you can feed one or two samples of script, like in a page of a manuscript into the search. It's processed through an artificial neural network. And then in the end, you get um, calculated how similar the two script samples are. So basically, if it's a match or not, this is done by a contrastive loss function. Um, yeah, but how do we teach the system to do what we want it to do? So how can we approach to uh, create such an artificial paleographer? So first of all, to train an artificial intelligence, we need ground truth, which means we need data about the data we want to analyze. In our case, these are a time of production, place of origin, and script style we are mostly interested in. So we are not interested in... Um, recognizing scribes because for medieval book hands, um, the, the script is not supposed to be individual and we don't have names of scribes. So that, that's basically impossible. Um, we need to compilate those training sets manually um, because we have to make sure that we have high quality data. And we also need to clean the data. So in the beginning, we um, excluded images with marginalia um, or changes of script or the hand on the page um, in order to help the system to learn how a manuscript page looks like, not to distract it with layout. Um, also, of course, annotations are often in, in a different script, maybe centuries later added. And then we have to evaluate the learning process. So which patterns does the machine recognize? Um, and also are the results meaningful for manuscript scholars? So it might be that we use all the ground truth we have um, and we do a lot of training, but in the end, it doesn't work out because um, maybe our ground truth is not good. Um, maybe the, the system is, is distracted. Um, yeah, we always say, can we train uh, Bernard Bischoff Robert, which is the yeah, 
probably most famous uh, palographer for medieval Latin palography. Um, yeah, often you say that computers and computational approaches come with a black box, especially artificial intelligence, but actually also palography is a big black box. Because script is um, sometimes described based on letter forms. Um, so we can, um, for example, when we look at, at half until we have uh, specific letter forms that um, peak out that are supposed to be characteristic. Um, but does the computer see the same when, when, when it looks at a script sample? Does it also, it, we don't teach the computer to look at a specific letter because then again, you have to extract it and segment it and analyze it. So it will look at the script as a whole as we also do it when we look at handwritings of, of family members or friends, we usually can immediately see who wrote something. Um, and also we don't know, basically, sometimes palographers describe a script by letter forms that are characteristic, but do we know if they base their decision on those letter forms when they say that a manuscript was written in a specific place? So also when it comes to modeling data, we are looking at the names of medieval scripts. Um, and we can find them sometimes in the descriptions, in the palographic descriptions of a manuscript. So here we have two samples from the um, Parker Library in Cambridge. Um, and the image on the left is described as in a good Caroline Minuscule, and the other image is described with in a somewhat sloping Caroline Minuscule. So what can the computer do with that kind of information? Um, it maybe can extract that it's a Caroline Minuscule, but it probably can't uh, work with in a good or in somewhat sloping especially not automatically. Um, or here we have the Caroline Unesco with many insular abbreviations. Um, the computer probably can't work with that. And also the description is not in the writing section, so in the metadata, but in the summary, so in the general overview over that manuscript. Here we have the example of the larger and rounder hand, clear and good. So a term for the script is not used at all because we all know that many palographers avoided using a specific term, but uh, instead described um, described the, what they see. Um, here we have a different format of metadata. It's the Ocodices TIXML file, and there they tried at least to, to tag script types and dating. Um, so in this case, they labeled the script as other because they couldn't identify it uh, because the description says a regular book minuscule. Um, but they also tag and normalize the dating. Not in this image, but they do. <laughs> um, so often when we also look at the metadata at the XML files, um, where we already have the luxury of, of a fully encoded and machine readable set of metadata, um, it's still human made. So we have errors in there. For example, in this image, you can see that someone um, got confused with not after and not before. Um, we can make up that error ourselves, but the computer can't. It will probably um, say that's, that's wrong, that's not working or not uh, include that manuscript uh, into the labeling process. So what we did then um, in our project, when I was facing the task of annotating manuscript samples and basically cleaning the metadata and picking out images that are um, clean and not too complex, we did build an annotation tool that uh, gets metadata from the IIIF manifest which is um, mainly meant to get an overview over the manuscript information. And then we extracted some information about um, dating and origin, place of origin and the script type from the standard descriptions in TEI, um, and which is not visible in the screenshot. You can click if you want to include an image in your data set. Um, and by this, I could really quickly manage to, to build data set and annotate them with ground truth. Um, so I'm including the, the dating, which is here somehow normalized with um, not before 800 and not, be, not after 899. So it's a ninth century manuscript. 
um, we don't have any information about the, the script type and we don't have any information about the place, but that one we can um, extract from the IIIF metadata. So that's again, doesn't work automatically, but with not a lot of effort, I can include that information and annotate my data. And the next step, we feed this annotated data. So we have um, the images and each image um, is provided with the ground truth labels. So we can see here, it, it gets uh, information about the dating, about the origin, um, not about the script, but here we have a scribe, which we have, I oh, don't no, it's a script. So we have a um, Roman minuscule and we feed these annotated data um, into neural networks and we get numbers as an output, um, as the output layer, and those numbers are the so-called fingerprint of the script. And if we do that with a lot of data, we get a lot of fingerprints, and those fingerprints are then stored in a database. Um, and when you feed new images, that's the idea. Um, it's yeah, the, the fingerprints are compared, and then you get information about about the similar, or you get as an output similar images, not numbers, but the similar images. So it's translated. But here we also arrive at the very well-known computational black box. The disadvantage of using artificial intelligence approaches is that um, we have no idea which features are considered for the script fingerprint. So um, we can't really, we tried, but we can't really visualize yet what the computer is looking at. If it's looking at specific letters, at specific um, angles, strokes, um, it can compare hundreds of features but we just don't know which ones are the distinct, the ones that are distinguishing between uh, two different scripts or the decision if two images are similar or not. That's yeah the setup. So we have our data and then I'm labeling the training data um, and part of the data is the validation data and some part is the test data. So the training data is the data we train our system on, uh, it's labeled. Um, we can use the metadata to give feedback. Um, so if a manuscript uh, matches with another manuscript and they are from completely different centuries, we can automatically say, this can't be correct, please retrain. Um, then we have validation data that is labeled and annotated. Um, it's to compare the results with a set of new data and the test data, the labels are removed um, and we can see if the system learned the right things. And then if that turns out well, um, we have a trained uh, AI model uh, that we can put into the wild and uh, we can feed it with new data and, and hope that it will also help others. So again, back to that image. Um, basically now we have the, the database of our fingerprints that we just um, trained. And when you input one image, um, it will search through the database uh, of fingerprints and then hopefully return your images that are um, similar. So now I've prepared like a sneak peek into our lab um, to show you a bit of, of the results that we had so far and uh, the failures also. Um, so one very important step that is often not mentioned enough and forgotten is that before you can start with the, with the analysis of um, script features, you need to perform layout analysis. Um, in our case, it consists, um, for example, of yeah, detecting where the text is and uh, a baseline detection uh, that segments the lines uh, and also ascenders and descenders pretty well. So this is a modern example from a different project, um, but it looks the same for the medieval script. And then uh, this is the slide with our first um, tries in 2019, 2020. Um, the first snippets that weren't as perfect as they are now. Um, but here we can see that uh, we have some pretty good results. So on the right uh, column, the first image here is the input image. And the other images are um, the similar images. I assume that they come all from the same manuscript, but the system at this point doesn't know it. Um, so it's kind of a success because we have also seen other things. Um, 
There's another example that uh, shows some similar examples, some not so similar examples. Um, this is what I call the barcode finder. So here, our line detection didn't work that well. Um, and of course, the system thinks that those lines are all very similar, but they just have um, all the same same error of cutting in the middle. So it looks like a, a barcode. So it doesn't really look at um, significant script features, but it, it's distracted um, by the wrong cutting. Last year, we started to experiment with visualizing um, discriminative features. So um, we try to find out a way to see what the computer is seeing and on what um, activations it's basing the decisions. Um, so we used saliency maps um, and a similarity score. And uh, the similarity score says how similar an image is. So in this case, it's uh, close to one. That means it's not very similar. Um, even though I think the scripts are not so dissimilar, um, but there's still a chance that it's distracted by the musical notations um, on the low, in the low, uh, yeah, on the uh, image down, um, or the color of the script. This is another example um, where it thinks it's relatively similar. Um, and we can see in the colorful lines, the brighter and then darker it gets. Uh, this are activation features. Um, but I must say that it's probably not enough information for me to see where the computer distinguishes um, or what, what it finds remarkable in the images uh, to base a decision on. Yeah, so. Um, here again, it, the computer says, um, so we are feeding two images that uh, come from different data sets with different ground truths, um, and it sees them also as relatively different. So by now we have uh, also changed, so we have labels and you can link them directly to the manuscripts and look up also the metadata um, to see how similar they are. So some of the challenges um, I faced so far um, is, of course, the lack of prepared data sets. Um, there are not many data sets out there that come with ground truth uh, that I could reuse. So I pretty much had to start from scratch. Um, there are, of course, the CLEM competition data sets, but they are based on um, images from the Manuscrit AT, uh, from the catalogs. And um, the image quality is not always the best. And it's also not entire pages, but uh, snippets of pages. So it, it's just one photograph of one page. And we don't have a lot of images from one, um, from one manuscript. So um, there is no platform. Like Not all the manuscripts from Manuscredate are digitized yet and accessible. So it's not really possible to reuse that data, even though it would be amazing and great data. Um, yeah, another thing can be the image quality. Um, it does, of course, work less good with uh, digitized microfilms with poor image quality. Often manuscripts um, are only provided on the platforms as JPEGs in a low resolution. Um, TIFF files that are also usually too big to process um, are not public. Um, and if the data that is down, yeah, that is accessible uh, in the platforms is uh, has a too low resolution it gets more difficult to process the data um, because we are using pre-processing steps that um, do not result in a huge loss of uh, image quality but if we already have images that uh, have lost some of their quality because of uh, the type of compression uh, they have undergone that's challenging for us uh, another challenge is also the deep learning models. Um, they are most of the time not public because uh, especially for face recognition um, and for yeah all sorts of developments, for example, by like Google, um, they are closed access because they are, you can probably make a lot of money with them. Um, 
we could not, we would not, uh, because I don't think the interest in medieval manuscripts is so big, but we of course can't reuse them because yeah, um, deep learning is, uh, is still booming um, and will continue to boom. Um, the medium manuscript has a, is, is a very complex type of document. Um, it's the layout, it's the decorations, the initials, rubrics, miniatures, and ornaments. Um, and it's also the script var variety. So often in one manuscript, you have um, parts from different centuries. Um, there is more than one script type used, even on a page level. For example, replications are used. Um, in one script, the main text is in one script, annotations can be in one or more scripts. And then of course, the material of the medieval manuscripts, um, the writing support can be damaged, uh, the ink can bleed through, so the computer can't distinguish between a bleed through of the ink um, and the text. Uh, we have traces of usage like dirt uh, that can't re be removed um, automatically. Um, Good image data can help with color spaces and scales, so um, you can at least um, process the original color values. And sometimes if you have images uh, where this is not the case, it gets more and more difficult to, um, yeah, to process the images and to um, focus on, on the features on the page, like on, in our case on the script that you're interested in. So um, sometimes you simply don't know if it's a feature or a bug on the page um, when you get a wrong dating um, for a manuscript. Because, of course, the computer won't see that there is a bug or some dirt sitting on the page. In this case, it's a paper, paper warm, I think. Um, yeah, some findings we had so far in our project uh, are that the choice of manuscript descriptions provided in digitized collection determines what is available for me. So if a collection decides to digitize, but not to provide descriptions in a machine readable format, so in um, an XML format in some kind of standard, but for example, just as a um, full text or a PDF uh, of a digitized catalog, um, it's kind of hard to, to reuse the data. Um, it takes a lot more time to read through descriptions to do research about the manuscripts to get the information um, about um, that I need to perform computation an analysis. Uh, and also the choice of metadata standards and encoding determines which information I can use. So at the moment, the situation is that uh, many collections are using different metadata standards. Um, and you, you need a script to access each of them, um, and you need to do it manually and find out which uh, metadata standard is used and how you can retrieve the information you're interested in. Um, but also about the encoding, so as we saw in the examples before, if you encode a script type um, and you tag it as a script type and you maybe even try to normalize it and even more important for the dating, um, I can reuse that information, but I can't perform a full text search or first analyze the text um, that will result in again more errors. And uh, it just takes also a lot of time to develop a different software to do that. Um, yeah, for the medieval book script, uh, one of the challenges is that uh, we need to represent the diversity in the training data. Um, compared to modern scripts, we of course don't have so many examples and we also have not too many descriptions but we have a lot of different scripts uh, that are closely related to their place and date of origin um, so we need to find a way in order to train a system that is really working um, to include as much diversity as possible um, into our training data um, but on a good note is that artificial intelligence can also learn on modern data so you just have to present it with a lot of different forms of script to teach it, script can look differently. Um, and then it might be able to transfer that knowledge also to, to our data. The ground truth label that I have been talking about so much um, are actually mainly for the human and not for the computer. So the computer performs its analysis um, and it gives you results. And then you can use the ground truth labels to give feedback, but also to follow the learning approach and to see how well it's working. Um, and for that reason, it's very important to 
curate your, your data very well. Also, something that is pretty difficult to accept is that you have to accept the fuzziness of the data. Um, do I really need to precise dating as ground truth? Um, do we really need script classification? We always think we need it in order to trust the computer to learn what we want it to learn. But on the other hand, human researchers don't need that either. So we have our ways of expressing a vague dating and everyone will understand our language uh, when a palographer describes a script. Um, it doesn't need to be precise and maybe we have to learn to, to trust uh, the computer, which sounds a bit weird, um, <laughs> but um, in the end, artificial intelligence is mainly knowledge reproduction. So what we know about manuscripts is what um, palographers and uh, manuscript scholars have researched over the centuries, probably over many, many years. Um, and we accept that as given, as correct, or sometimes debatable. Um, the computer will not be better than experts in manuscript studies. Um, it will be able to process more data. It will be able to analyze more data and compare more data at the same time. But it will um, always only know what we know. Maybe it can point us out to, to new things to look at, but um, there is no such thing as uh, the um, scientific AI that will be much smarter than we are, at least not for now. Yeah, when you work on providing data and digitizing manuscripts, always keep in mind that you have to keep your data fair. So findable, um, the data and metadata needs to be findable for humans and computers. Um, it needs to be accessible. So humans and computers can access and download data sets. It needs to be interoperable. So data from different data sets and collections can be prepared to be combined and exchanged. Um, so you might save some work and just help each other out. And it needs to be reusable. So uh, the published data can be easily reused. Um, it also needs open copyright um, and so on. I always like to visualize my, uh, my PhD research with this um, lost data map because it, it combines a lot of the challenges that um, people working with uh, historic manuscripts uh, and digitizing them um, encounter. So uh, you have information uh, and manuscripts in many different places, in many different types of, uh, of qualities. Uh, Sometimes uh, you have the Excel desert and you have a lot of data loss somewhere uh, in the digital age, but also before. And you kind of have to learn how, how to deal with it. Um, so one of the positive sides of, uh, of, of my research here in the Netherlands is that uh, I'm not only working with existing manuscript collections um, to try new research methods and to experiment with it and to evaluate them, but uh, that we are also in the um, process of uh, digitizing manuscripts in the Netherlands. Um, as I said before, the situation here is not, not the best one yet. So there are some collections digitized, um, not easy findable. Um, so we are currently um, having a pilot project, uh, which is called Ecodes SNL, uh, like the Swiss one a virtual library for medieval manuscripts in the Netherlands. Um, and we are performing on-site digitization with a traveler's conservation copy stand. Um, so we go to the libraries and digitize there. Um, and we try to systematically digitize the medieval Latin manuscripts and Dutch collections, um, transform descriptive metadata to a shared standard, uh, make them available via IFFF, um, but also to include existing digital collections uh, into this new platform to bring everything together. Germany does a similar thing at the moment with the Handschriften Portal. Um, so we are starting with uh, three libraries. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a very nice combination to, on the one hand, work with data that is already um, accessible, but also have influence on. Uh, on the next project um, with the experience I've made in, in my previous project so far. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for your attention um, and uh, look forward.
looking forward to your questions that you might have. <laughs> Thank you, Hannah. I think I'll leave the uh, the question uh, sec session. Um, uh, I think so. We we met already in the past, uh, the two of us. Oh, I'll start yeah. the questions. And uh, I think I, I still keep on being puzzled. Um, so by by the fact that. Um, the method, like the way of analyzing uh, basically pictures, digitized material, is very different from other projects, as you already mentioned, so that the idea is not to focus that much on single letters and then make somehow the computer describe what it's seeing. Um, and that's the point that I would like actually to understand. So as far as I understand, um, is it um, you you feed the computer a certain amount of data, which is described according to how we would like to have it described paleographically, I mean. And is then the computer uh, fetching back to you once it learned something about the script? the same uh, or like a certain amount of images that uh, correspond to description that you gave or not, or or is that not the objective? What's kind of the final, or um, how can that be used in the future, I guess, by other researchers or just users? Yeah, I think I always like to see it a bit as this image similarity search to mm -hmm. also move the search for manuscripts um, on the image level and not just on the on the metadata level. Um, so in the training process, it's indeed that um, it gives images back um, with a score of similarity. And then I can look in the ground truth that I've provided um, how similar they are. So we try to teach the system what a paleographer sees. Um, and it's difficult because first I was always busy with uh, normalizing data and said, I really need uh, correctly dated manuscripts um, and I need to be 100% sure. But uh, actually, um, yeah, the, the black box of AI is a bit that it's, it's looking at, at features and uh, we only use the ground truth to give feedback. Um, so if um, the label, for example, is um, different, so it, it says, for example, 9th century, and the other one is 12th century. Um, and then we have the, this, it's called contrastive loss. Um, the similarity score mm -hmm. um, says that the computer sees something very similar. Then we have to investigate what is going wrong in the system, basically. I hope that's uh, understandable. So yeah, when we have, um, when the computer sees two images with the same ground truth as different, then there are two options, or there's an error in the data, or we have to tell the computer, sorry, we are not there yet, try again, and then it will start learning again. Um, and we always have to be careful that it's not um, memorizing exactly the image that it has been fed with. So that can also happen if you don't have enough data, it just learns all it sees by heart, and then basically can reproduce it, the, the image again. Um, but that's what I meant with the ground truth, that it's maybe more important for the human than for the computer, because the computer analyzes a lot of different features. But since it's so computing intense, we can't visualize them exactly, because that would just take forever. Um, and that's what um, the other approaches often do, that look at specific. It's a completely different approach. Uh, it's still algorithms somehow, but um, it looks at, uh, yeah at characteristics and features, but then you all first have to segment them and to isolate them, and then you can compare them. And the deep learning approach doesn't do it. So we just say, these two are similar, analyze why, but don't tell us. <laughs> so it's a bit, yeah. It's, it's kind of mind blowing. It, it took me a long time actually to, to accept and to understand it um, and to trust also the, the people I'm working with, uh, my colleagues. Um, that's a lot of communication between computer science and uh, paleography and digital humanists. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And 
So would, for example, one of the possible results be that, I don't know, in the future, um, you have one page that you are interested in or one script, and then the computer will give you as a result um, kind of a list with a percent, like a matching percentage, we could say. So I don't know, this other yeah, page would, is 100% yeah. matching and this other page is 25 or something like that. Yeah, something like that. So you can imagine that if we um, access everything um, that is available in IIIF, so it's linked to it, so we can insert or also via IIIF or just upload an image and say, or a couple of images and say, hey, look into all collections. Mm -hmm. Um, and find manuscripts that are written in the similar script. And then as a, yeah, as a result, it would list you all the manuscripts, um, maybe manuscripts you haven't thought of. Um, and the same could happen, yeah, of course, for writer identification, um, that you would find a script sample um, that you didn't know of, but it's available online. Um, or just in your corpus, it can also be a local corpus. Mm -hmm. um, that you can basically cluster um, scripts according to their similarity. So you would get indeed um, a list of, of manuscripts, images back um, with some sort of percentage of similarity. And if you train it, you would then probably give feedback and say, okay, this worked out well, this didn't work out well, try again um, when you train, but yeah. So it will always also everything that you develop in the beginning is, is one model and then you have to train it further for a new task. I think I think I will um, not take too much advantage of my position here. Um, of course, <laughs> if there are questions, please do feel free to, to ask um, anything that or comments or suggestions for other aspects to research. Hannah. Did you ever experiment with other scripts than from for, from the Latin? One? Yes, we have other scripts in there. We have Hebrew in there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know what. Oh, we have more modern scripts in there, but I know for sure that maybe some Arabic. Um, but you can see that um, it groups Hebrew together, but then we showed it to, um, to an expert of Hebrew scripts and they said, yeah, you don't see it, but the samples that came back as similar are from many different centuries. Wow, okay. <laughs> um, so it really, needs, it really needs the expert knowledge to start the training, but it could distinguish between Latin and Hebrew. Um, so of course, if you train it, it, it really needs to learn to see that there are many different scripts. Um, that they look different. Um, and that can be done with all kinds of script. Of course, when they're very different, um, it's easier to say, okay, it doesn't look like the Latin script I'm used to. Um, and you can always, like we also pre-train models uh, on, on script and then we fine tune them on, on my task. So I'm, uh, my data set is fairly small compared to, for example, early modern scripts. Um, <laughs> And I'm yeah experimenting with that, and I think also it will be yeah some sort also about the failure and about um, what what we can do with the data we have now with the descriptions. Um, though I'm very optimistic that uh, we can accept the fuzziness and uh, we might not need the most perfect ground truth. But of course, for me to understand the system, I just need to know because from one snippet, I can't tell who wrote it, where was it written, when was it written. It's not enough information. Um, so that's yeah, also something that I have to keep in mind. So it's, it's sometimes it happens that uh, they sh like our developers show, show me a, a result, like I showed them in the slides. With the saliency maps, the colorful ones, and, and do you think did it work out? I was like, one line for me is just not enough. I'm not a computer, and I also know that the computer analyzed more than that one line. Um, but that's just the result it, it gives, the, yeah, the visual result it gives for now. But I would need to click and zoom into the entire manuscript and uh, into the data I provided to then say, okay, how acceptable is, is the result right now? Um, yeah.
I don't know if Marcus sees any um, possibility for us to learn from from this. We will see. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of. Um, I mean, there's so many options to approach analysis, and you also have to see what data you have available, and uh, also experiment what what is possible. Um, but it's unfortunately that not a lot of software is is out there yet that you can just try and also what i mentioned that there are no visual interfaces so um, user interfaces so it's it's um for the humanity scholar pretty difficult to to use the software so that's something hopefully like also what we envision for the ecodesis and l project is a platform where you not only have the manuscripts but also uh, a link or tools that you can use um, so also what Triple F is, is giving options to annotate. And I also still think that Digipol is a great tool to um, annotate features um, manually that you then can use for further computation and analysis if you want to. Um, mm -hmm. But what is not existing at the moment is like a platform where you have access to the tools um, and especially the ones including more computing um, are, don't have, yeah. There's also often not enough money to have a user interface. So I think that's something that needs to change in the future to, to get people to use those tools. And then it will also be possible to develop them further. Because my set of data, of course, is fairly small. But if uh, 10 other people do the same, um, so if more people would yeah, annotate data and run then experiments once the system is, is working, of course, helps helps also the discipline um, of yeah digital paleography, and that's also why yeah the exchange of data um, and using shared standards is so important because then not only your project can use the data you provide, but also others can access it without having to transform it again to to their standards. So yeah. Actually, to this, and I think that's my my really my last question. Um, how easy it is the adherence so triple F and or triple I F, sorry, and um, yeah. So, for example, you know, I'm thinking about our case with some of the material uh, having been digitized in Bulgaria or in Russia, and so on. Is that um, first of all, would these institutions? Like, would it be possible for them to adhere to? to? And the second question would be, um, is that a way to, for example, just have, um, yeah, free accessible data without the need to, I don't know, for example, buy the images or, you know, how that um, works? So, yeah, Triple IF, um, I think it's more or less possible for everyone. It's fairly easy. I would say to implement it. Um, so it would give the possibility to um, get access to all the images that are already out there by just adding the IIIF manifest. Of course, you have to co cooperate with the institutions because you, I think you need a, uh, an image server for that. Um, but if they use a completely different standard and now you couldn't just take the image URL and, and use it in your viewer, with IIIF you can. So it, it's a very easy solution to put together um, and link images and, and yeah, manuscripts that somehow form a collection. Um, the ref doesn't give any guarantee for a specific image quality. So if the institution has decided to um, provide the images in a fairly poor quality, Triple F wouldn't change that. So that's always something that needs to be discussed. Sometimes they just have that one image quality. Um, sometimes they decided for some reasons not to publish images in a really good quality. That does mm -hmm. also happen. Um, it still happens also because, yeah, TIFF files are uh, very big. And, but yeah, there's a huge uh, variance in image quality. Um, but it can be a solution to bring together a collection in one platform fairly easy. Um, 
with yeah with the triple f um, interfaces um, without redoing everything it's, mm. it's just addition basically otherwise you would have to um, migrate probably the images to one server and to one platform um, to have them yeah to because usually a platform of, of digitized manuscripts it always includes a viewer otherwise you would not be able to view the images um, and the books together with the descriptive or basic metadata um, and if two different repositories use two different standards and viewers um, you can't have them on one on one web page um, so easily but with triple f and for example a mirador viewer you can so you can just in, include them like that okay okay but which is the good quality image um it's hard to say so they should have a specific mm. resolution usually of uh i think it's 300 to 400 dpi and maybe 24 or 48 bit color depth and it's also always handy to have the color checker, which not every collection did while digitizing, and also um, a ruler to be able to understand the size of the book, because the, the digital image um, doesn't give you the impression which, yeah, how big a book was. That's super difficult. Sometimes you see an image and you think, oh, that's a huge codex. And then you go to the library and they give you a tiny pocketbook. <laughs> um, and also then to process and to uh, be able to see, okay, it's a huge script, it's a small script. Um, so there are some, yeah, um, that's important. And um, yeah, but I'm not, yeah, I'm, I think I'm not the expert of image um, processing. Um, but yeah, better the better the quality, the better the results are. But uh, some things are also possible with, uh, with a not so good image quality. Um, and I think, yeah, every, every image is better than no image. Also because we won't have the money to redo all the digitization. So it's first, I think, uh, put everything, get everything digitized and then we can think about redoing. Um, but when you start to digitize, you should always aim for a very good quality and um, good standards and um, talk to other collections and repositories and Thank you. Um, I would assume that if there are no further questions. Um, yep. Always a lot of information uh, <laughs> talking about AI. So I hope it, it was uh, clear and understandable, but uh, yeah. I think, I think it was very clear. I mean, the approach is completely different from, um, yeah from other other projects that are out there and i think it's important for us to see um, what what's going on in other fields of paleography in order to decide how to move on in yeah. a way um, to my understanding is once this selection pre-selection comparison was done um, it's still down to the job of the paleographer to do the uh, qualitative work in a way. So, of course, if there is a tool that identifies for me all the samples which are relevant uh, or are linked to one scribe or to a copying school, that's quite quite beautiful. Yeah. Once more, yeah, probably our field is a little bit different than from from Latin paleography or like the, because not that many sources are available online, um, but things are changing. Yeah, it's good to have the yeah and this perspective or look also look into the future and and like have yeah have an overview to before you proceed and uh... yeah exactly and kind of right away so know also what's needed um, so that if we are at the beginning of some kind of path to know where exactly uh, you know in which direction to 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 go and learn from others' experience. 
Yeah, there's a lot happening. I think there will be a lot of things um, changing and being developed in the next year. So I think it's also worth following uh, what is going on um, because, of course, it gets more and more powerful and uh, the more research is done about uh, what what are the important things to take care of um, performing such, such research. Um, it will always add to the field. Um, Great then. Um, thank you very much for, for the seminar. Um, I don't know, Mark, for the announcement for the next seminar. Da, mislim, po dobre na bolgarski, zašto vsički drugi misle, če sa bolgarojezični. Znači, sledvašte seminar ste vede točno sled edin mesec na 17. mart. I ste govorim za digitalizirani kolekciji na rakapisi v Rusija. Kako to napravihme za Bolgarija i Srbija minalija pot, sledvašte pa ste vede za Rusija. I kako to vinagi ste vsički dobre došli. Hvala večer, ankora gracije a Hanna per questa interesante seminario, ki ci da rada... Grazie per l'invito. Ci da rada discutere, speriamo di poter ancora discutere con te. Sì, molto volentieri. Di queste cose. Many thanks to Hanna. I think that I shall write to you, Hanna. Yeah, please do so. Because I have a lot of questions and I don't feel competent enough to ask them. So maybe I shall write to you if you... Yeah, please do so. Agree. Looking forward to your questions. Thank you. It was a very important, a very important presentation, I think. So thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.